righty. Good morning, everybody. My name is Janie Montblanc, and on behalf of the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange, the Sage Grouse Initiative, the Intermountain Inter West Joint Venture, Working Lands for Wildlife, USDA NRCS, uh, the Sage Step Project, and the Society for Ecological Restoration, I would like to welcome you to this webinar titled New Tools for Pinion Juniper Management. Balancing the Needs of Sagebrush and Woodland Obligate Birds, presented by Jason Tack, Wildlife and Conservation Biologist, Biologist with the Fish and Wildlife Service, and Jeremy Maestas, National Sagebrush Ecosystem Specialist with the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Before I introduce our presenters, I will go over some webinar details. If you have questions or comments, please type them into the questions window of your control panel located at the top right of your screen. I will field questions after the presentation, but please feel free to submit them during the webinar because it's nice to have some ready in the queue. I also want to let you know that whatever you do in your control panel does not affect the webinar, so you're welcome to type a test message or test your audio at any time during the webinar. If you're having problems with your audio, please open your audio window and check your audio selections. I also want to let you know that this webinar has been pre-approved for continuing education credits with the Society for Ecological Restoration and the Society for Range Management. You'll receive a certificate of attendance after the webinar and we'll provide information on how to obtain credit in the follow-up email. All right, now I'll introduce our presenters. Jeremy Maestas is the National Sagebrush Ecosystem Specialist for the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service where he helps NRCS staff and partners across the West put science into practice to conserve and restore working lands. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you. Jason, Jason Tack is a wildlife biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Habitat and Population Evaluation Team. He's based in Missoula, Montana, where he partners with the Sage Grouse Initiative, working on developing targeting tools for conservation and outcomes-based analyses. Welcome, Jason. Thank you. All right, Jason, take it away. Okay, good morning, everyone. This is Jeremy. Actually, I'm going to provide a few introductory remarks and then turn it over to Jason for the bulk of the presentation. But I wanted to start first with some really important background information to frame up how, how we think about pinion juniper management. Um, pinion juniper woodlands exist as a diverse continuum of vegetation types from savannas to persistent woodlands and wooded shrublands spanning some 100 million acres across the Intermountain West making it uh, the third largest vegetation type. Pinion pine and juniper are native trees that are expanding into previously treeless grasslands and shrublands but we're not unique in the West um, this is a global phenomenon with native tree expansion having been documented on every continent except Antarctica. Two to six fold increases in pinion juniper woodlands have been documented in the Great Basin since the late 1800s. Next, Jason. 90% of that expansion has occurred in sagebrush ecosystems, which is what we're mainly going to be talking about here today. This continuum is critical to keep in mind when discussing pinion juniper management, as our objectives and approaches vary by site type. If you take nothing else away from this talk, please keep this continuum in mind when discussing PJ management. Every conversation we have really needs to begin by asking, where are we talking about managing pinion juniper along this continuum? Next slide. Now, if you've been following the national media on pinion juniper management recently, you might be scratching your head wondering uh, what's going on. The hyperbole is getting really extreme. In fact, you may even wonder, why would anyone even do this? Unfortunately, there just hasn't been a lot of nuance being presented about where treatments are occurring or for what purpose. And so um, what we wanted to do first before diving into some of the new products is start by recapping um, what some of the recent science is saying about why pinion juniper removal is being done 
specifically from the standpoint of sagebrush dependent wildlife habitat restoration. Um, and so we'll, we'll have Jason do that and then transition into some of the new spatial tools that he's developed uh, to help us even better balance the needs of multiple species when we're doing our management out there. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Jason. All right, thanks. Thanks, Jeremy, and thanks, folks, for tuning in today. Hope everybody's staying healthy and safe out there. Um, as Shanae mentioned, I'm a, a wildlife biologist by trade, so I think mostly about uh, critters, their habitats, and their populations. And so my literacy with respect to uh, conifer expansion, which I'll use broadly to capture pinion and juniper in the West, really came about about seven years ago with this paper by Sharon Barack Murdo from the Nature Conservancy. And what she did, what you see in this figure here, is basically look at all these local and landscape factors that give rise to persistent, healthy lex in Oregon. And she looked at myriad factors of um, conifers, uh, different types of habitats, elevation, things like that, that we know structure sage grouse populations. And what was striking to me is one of the greatest sources of variation explaining what causes the lek to persist or become extirpated is the amount of conifer cover at a really local scale, about one to three kilometers out from the lek. You can see here that only about 4% canopy cover. If you imagine a checkerboard, that's two checkers on that board, a very small footprint, is basically enough to cause an otherwise healthy lek to become extirpated. Now that opened my eyes because as Jeremy mentioned, this is a natural uh, footprint on the landscape. But again, the response by uh, biotic species is that it's tantamount to other large scale top down stressors. So that hockey stick shape we see there is basically what we see with energy development across the West, large scale agricultural conversion, sub, uh, suburban development. Um, so it's a very unique um, stressor in that it's natural but the consequences are severe. And so that finding about seven years ago really drove the management for sage grouse in particular to target these early invading uh, conifer areas, what we typically call phase one. So what you see on the right side of the screen there is that continuum that Jeremy was talking about from sagebrush rangelands to persistent woodlands all the way on the uh, right side. And so basically, the management strategy was to prioritize early phases of invasion that are in and around priority sagebrush habitat. We've got a lot of spatial tools developed for sage grouse over the past decade or so, especially since the uh, listing decision in 2015, to tell us the most critical breeding habitats and where to target this management. And also, more selective techniques were used in managing conifers. So these are out there with hand crews using lop and scatter techniques or mastication to target these landscapes. Now, since Barack Murdo, that saw really that top-down um, or stressor on population, we've learned a lot through science about what the mechanisms are in terms of limiting sage grouse populations from conifer removal, or excuse me, from conifers, and what happens to sage grouse populations following removal. And so basically, we found that every stage of uh, key stressor or points for, for sage grouse population in terms of behavior. So think about the choices that individuals are making, where they nest, the habitats that they use, how those choices propagate to demography, what is their nest success, their survival, things like that, and how that all gives rise to their population performance. We found that amongst conifers, all these things are depressed. So basically, when they have the opportunity to avoid conifers, they do. When they don't have that opportunity, they suffer demographic consequences, and that propagates up to what we see in Sharon Barack Murdo's findings, that basically we, we lose those local populations. Now, the flip side of that is there's been a lot of studies that have done before and after controls to look at what happens when you actually go in and remove conifer. We found that it's almost instant habitat. So basically, nesting areas that are free from conifer get used almost immediately. We see a positive response in all the three pillars basically of sage grouse population ecology, which is nest survival, chick survival, and survival of the adults. And then that all, again, bubbles up to population increases. So this really culminated in a large scale, long-term study 
done at uh, Oregon State University, led by Christian Hagen and Dr. Andrew Olson, who found that over about an eight-year period where they were monitoring uh, both sage grouse individuals using telemetry, GPS technology, and county and left as well, was in a landscape where they had conifer removal, they saw about a 12% population increase relative to a nearby landscape that did not have conifer removal. And so I just want to pause here for a moment and say that in the terrestrial world of wildlife, we don't really have examples where a restoration tool can actually impact lambda population growth, which should be the gold standard for any restoration tool. So this is exciting in terms of going back to that initial paper where we do have this large scale top down stressor to populations. And now that through science and management, we know that we have a fix for it as well. And so there's been a great increase in management for these early invading uh, phase one, phase two stands where sage grouse exist. And we've heard a lot, uh, Jeremy talked about the hyperbole, the narratives going along with that. And so it's important to take a top-down look from 30,000 feet about what's actually been done for management. So what you see here is a study that's recently published by Dr. Jason Reinhardt that used remote sensing to say what actually has been removed in terms of the conifer footprint due to both management and then also wildfire, which we know is a naturally occurring phenomenon that also reduces the footprint of conifer. And what he found is that across at least the sagebrush range in the west, there's about a 1.6 reduction in conifer over about a five to 10 year period. And a two thirds of that was attributed to management. The other was due to wildfire. Now over half of that occurred within priority areas for conservation. These are the areas that we've all galvanized around for sagegrass conservation. So we know that targeting occurring become key watersheds. But current efforts may just be keeping up with persistent encroachment and infill. Here's a quick shot on the change in tree cover from the rangeland analysis platform for the past almost 20 years now. And what we can see is that everything in blue there is basically where we have significant increase in tree cover. And that's certainly what dominates the West. And it's estimated from local studies that rates of expansion increase about half to one and a half percent per year. So despite all these increasing efforts in management and what's happening nationally from wildfire, excuse me, we still have an increasing footprint of conifers across the West, particularly in sagebrush systems, as Jeremy mentioned. So what are the impacts to uh, sagebrush dependent wildlife? I talked about sage grouse and they've certainly been our, our currency for understanding the impacts of land use change on wildlife and sagebrush systems. But we know that this impacts other sagebrush specialists as well. Look at the pygmy rabbit, certainly our most adorable species in sagebrush systems. We find that um, basically the biggest change in decreased use of sites is attributed to increasing conifer cover. Increasing conifer cover basically removes the herbaceous understory that they use for forage and also increases predation risk. And so we see an overall decline of pygmy rabbits where we have encroaching conifers. For mule deer, results are a little more nuanced because mule deer certainly use pinyon pine juniper areas during their uh, year-round habitat selections. But it's important to note that if we look at actually the population ecology of mule deer, what's most limiting to populations, it seems, is overwinter survival. Keep, you know, keeping moms fed and uh, with enough fat to get through the winter to produce fawns in the following spring. What we find is basically nutrition seems to be limiting. And so when actual experiments that have been done on large scales, they find that removing conifer and fertilizing some of these areas leads to increased fat and retention in females and greater overwinter survival. We also see small mammal populations, uh, those that are sagebrush decline across large areas with increasing footprints of conifer cover and certainly songbird populations. We'll talk a little bit more about this now. Songbirds that are relying on sagebrush habitats decline almost wholeheartedly once we have encroaching conifers. So one of the best uh, Baki studies out there, that's before and after looking at basically what happens to sagebrush obligate songbirds in response to conifer removal finds that we can actually improve or see increases in some of these populations 
when we remove conifer. So look at here, this is some work from Aaron Holmes. This is in Oregon, published in 2017, that found that populations of sagebrush obligate brewer sparrow and green tail toey, which breed in sagebrush habitats, increase 55 to 81% following removal. To note here that we have sea gray flycatcher, a species dependent on pinion juniper, consequently declining. Now this is important to look at in terms of range-wide long-term trends for populations. And so what I want you to look across now is the top. These are basically breeding bird survey trends since 1966, showing declines in sagebrush alligator, sagebrush dependent songbirds over the past 60 years. So again, brewer sparrow, green-tailed towing, and sage thasher all showing significant declines. Now contrast that along the bottom with pinion juniper woodland line birds. Ash-throated flycatcher, gray flycatcher, gray vireo, all showing increasing trends. Now, folks were tuned in to a science report that came out over the past year that showed losses of an estimated billions of land birds. Increasing trends isn't necessarily the norm for our land bird populations. But of course, it's not all rosy for pinion juniper reliant birds. And of course, the pinion jay, we see steep declines where they've declined uh, more severely than perhaps any other land bird in the Western US. And so when we look for tools to inform conservation, uh, we look to the breeding bird survey, which has really informed a lot of what we know about um, our land bird population, both through time and across states. And so it's what's taught us that um, pinion jays have been in steep decline over the past 60 years. It showed us generally the spatial trends of where those declines have happened. And it shows us generally where populations are across the West. But we wanted to take a little more nuanced look at and develop these habitat-based abundance maps to help inform a conservation strategy for both sagebrush obligate songbirds and these woodland obligates as well, with pinion jay in particular being on our mind. And so what you see here, all these little squiggly lines of breeding bird survey routes that are surveyed annually by citizen scientists, again, for almost 50, 60 years now, uh, across the West, actually across the U.S. And what we did is basically take all these routes, which are about 25 miles, and broke them up into these little point counts, these three minute point counts that people do every year to look at a very fine scale unit to map habitat. And we took the counts of birds across time and basically said, how does that vary with habitat at local and landscape scales, weather and climate patterns, topography, fire, things that we know are gonna influence the settling patterns of birds. And we use these to make predictive maps of relative abundance. And so here's just an example of Brewer's Thorough map where the darker colors represent a higher predicted relative abundance of Brewer's Thorough. And so you can see if you're tuned into the landscape that these areas are generally where you have more sagebrush like the Wyoming Basin. And contrast that with Pinion Jake where we have again the higher, or excuse me, the darker colors representing the higher predicted relative abundance. We can see a more southerly distribution areas congregate around these sort of warm valleys in Nevada. And so that allows us to do two things. One is we can actually use these as spatial planning tools, but we can also ask questions retrospectively about particularly here, the influence of management on songbird populations. And so one of our first questions was, does conifer management impact pinion jay? Well, the simple answer is, of course it does. And we've got strong evidence to suggest that. So there's a recent conservation strategy that summarizes the available science out there really well, put together by Scott Summershoe. And if we look at, there's a few papers in particular that should look at response of pinion jays to management. But of course, it's critical to understand the spatial context of this inference. Just like Jeremy said at the beginning, if you take one thing away from this talk, it's thinking about this in terms of a continuum. So if we dive into some of these studies that have found impact to pinion jays in response to woodland management, we need to look really carefully at the spatial context where this is occurring. So there's a study in New Mexico um, by Christine, Dr. Christine Johnson and others that found that they did have reduced uh, pinion jay nesting habitat among fuels treatments in this persistent woodland in northern New Mexico. And in central Colorado, it's found that at, at least at local scales, 
uh, thinning project did seem to alter avian occupancy for pinyon jay, where they saw localized declines in pinyon jay occurrence in response to management. Again, these areas occurring in persistent woodlands. Now, again, if we back up and contrast that with areas that are managed for sage brush or sage grouse in this case, we can look at cuts that have been done specifically for sage grouse under the sage grouse initiative. So if you look at that map in the upper left, all those brown dots are conifer treatments. The bigger the dot, the larger the treatment. And contrast that um, with the previous studies located there in the orange dots. And that green background there is basically the occupied range of sage grouse. And so what we did is we took all those maps that we developed that told us the relative abundance of different species and looked at where cuts have taken place and said, did these generally target areas where we see higher abundance of these birds or did they typically avoid them? And what we found is that if we look at those birds that we know respond positively to conifer management from some of the past work, we see that brewer sparrow, sage thrasher, green-tailed towhee, all seem to align, at least their distinct abundances align with areas that we've managed for conifer. And we've generally avoided, at least for these targeted areas, again, at that shrubland, wooded shrubland interface for pinion jet. So what's going on? Um, so we're gonna leave the world now of what the past science has told us now and get into more of a hypothesis generation world based off the um, what's out there for science. So basically what might be going on is that pinion J are on a similar arc of peril due to woodland infill, just as sagebrush and sagebrush obligates are from expansion. And what we mean by this is similarly as sagebrush systems are encroached or invaded by conifer and we see a reduction in sagebrush obligate um, populations, the infill of mixed woodlands or areas where we have productive uh, pinion, pinion pine systems might be similarly impacted by infill. And so let's walk through this real quick. Some of the work, past work that we have out there about what pinion jays key into, we see that pinion vigor, which is basically a proxy for pinion nut production, decreases. We see a decreasing probability of use by pinion jays as pinion vigor decreases. And we know that infill, that's the expansion of uh, woodlands among existing woodlands also leads to a decrease in vigor as tree density increases and trees get bigger. Now this is interesting. We can look at some recent science by Stephen Filipelli et al, who did a similar remote sensing project looking at the changes of woodland communities across the West over about a 20 year period. And so if you look at this figure on the left, basically, that one-to-one -one line you see is the change from 2000 to 2016 in forest cover. And all that blue area is what was actually observed across that landscape over the time period. And so what you can see is that basically across that continuum from zero to 60%, there's been increases in forest cover. Now those darker colors are telling us that we actually seen more increases in some of those areas that are already forested. So this paper basically told us that over the past 20 years, we've seen about a million acres added of forest cover at a rate of half a percent per year. That's resulted in over 10 million tons of biomass added to the system, 80% of which occurred as infill. Now this is important because we have space to this, we can see that where a lot of this infill is happening may be in preferred habitats for pinion jay. So on the right, you can see a map of predicted occurrence for pinion jay. Uh, a product from the Great uh, Basin Bird Observatory that's in this um, conservation strategy. And you can basically see that higher predicted occurrence across the foothills of some of these wooded areas. Now go back to the left and you see this map, central Nevada, where we basically have above ground biomass change from that 20 year period from that Filipelli paper. Everything in green is where we see a significant increase in infill and purple is where we see decline. So in the center of that, you can see a fire that actually led to a decrease in forest cover. But along those edges, basically those same areas where pinion jays seem to have higher predicted occurrence, we see an increase in infill. And that's not the only uh, factor that might be increasing 
or excuse me, decreasing the impact, the, uh, the preferred habitats for pinyon jay. So we do see some drought-induced pinyon pine mortality happening in places where we've got large die-outs happening in Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, again, preferred core habitats for pinyon jays. And this is resulting in a shift to more drought tolerant junior juniper, which has a, a less preferred seed production for pinyon jay, maybe limiting populations as well. And with that, I'll kick it back to Jeremy to wrap up on some holistic watershed approaches for management. Great, thanks, Jason. So, you know, we're trying to constantly improve our management approach and balance the needs of multiple species, right? Not just get uh, this perception of picking winners and losers. So how can we use this new science, this information and, and some ideas about what might be happening to, to think more holistically? Um, you know, the, the long-term population data, population data for sage grouse and pinyon jay are telling us that the status quo isn't working. Remote sensing data uh, show us that woodland change continues today to affect both shrublands and woodlands. We've targeted uh, conifer removal and really scaled that up to save sagebrush shrublands that are increasingly squeezed by habitat losses to fire and cheatgrass at lower elevations. But legitimate concerns remain about potential impacts of treatments on pinion jays that have adapted to using encroach shrublands. Um, and, and as Jason demonstrated, you know, we can continue to steer our sagebrush restoration projects away from sensitive areas for jay, and we've largely been doing that. We could probably do even better. But I would challenge our group to think, you know, and our, our, our whole community here to be thinking that um, perhaps a simple avoidance strategy might not be enough. And it, it actually could result in continued declines for both grouse and jays. Um, so really like to start a conversation about a more holistic watershed approach that includes site appropriate restoration all along that pinion juniper continuum that I introduced you to. We have uh, increasingly the ecological site information that our, our, our soils and our range folks provide us that helps us understand site potential and do management in a nuanced way. Next slide. And we can combine that with this new technology from a, a wildlife landscape ecology standpoint. And, and gain a better understanding of the importance of spatial context for restoration and really use that species abundance information to better target our management. And I just want to tell a little story here about the evolution of uh, sage grouse conservation. We had a huge breakthrough back in 2010 with the publication of what we called the breeding bird density maps, which is what is depicted here on the left. Those dots, essentially the darker dots, represent a higher abundance of sage grouse on lex. Um, these ma abundance maps revealed for the first time that although the range of sage grouse was really large, birds were not uniformly distributed across that landscape. 75% of the birds could be found on just 25% of the land area. For the first time, this really allowed the development of a strategic approach to conservation where actions could be focused where they would mean the most for grouse. Eventually, the breeding density maps were combined with local knowledge and additional seasonal habitat information to form what we now know as priority areas for conservation or PACs, the, the map on the right. PACs now serve as a centerpiece for sage grouse and sagebrush habitat conservation guiding both policy protections and active habitat restoration. Next slide. So I guess what I'm trying to paint here for you in terms of what we could do as a community is uh, utilize the abundance maps that Jason and his colleagues have developed here uh, that give us a similar picture of a variation in songbird abundance as a starting point 
for a strategic conservation actions that could be designed to benefit both woodland and sagebrush songbirds beyond just this current sage grouse model we have. While these maps are regional in nature and specific to the sagebrush biome, uh, we can still, again, combine them with local knowledge and data to refine those priority areas for management. So, uh, luckily, all of this stuff is at your fingertips and, and readily available on a free web application, map.sagegrouseinitiative.com. We've got uh, maps like you see here depicted uh, for nine songbird species, um, uh, including the primary species of conservation concern, both in sagebrush and PJ associated woodland birds. So with that, um, I'm gonna wrap up and we'll have a lot of time for questions and discussion. But I first want to acknowledge um, this work was supported by a diverse group of partners, uh, including uh, the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, uh, Fish and Wildlife Services HAPIT uh, team and science application teams, and the NRCS's uh, Working Lands for Wildlife. So with that, uh, Jason, go ahead and we'll close out. And uh, Janie, we'll turn it over to you to facilitate some questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, all right, so if you have questions, please type them in the questions window of your control panel at the top right of your screen. And unlike our last webinar, we're gonna stop the Q&A at the top of the hour, but um, like Jeremy said, we have plenty of time. We have a whole half hour. But if there are any um, unanswered questions after the webinar, we'll follow up with you afterward. All right, first a comment, die-offs of pinion and juniper are also happening in Southeast Utah. Oh yeah, let's video cam us for, um, for the questions. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, after that comment, the first question is, is most of the infill in persistent woodlands due to juniper increase and not pinion pine increase? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm not as familiar with the stand level information, um, but I know there's people at UNR, Peter Weisberg and others are doing localized studies on that and we could probably dig in. I know they've got some stuff coming with more details about the um, drought induced change that's occurring, but um, pinion pine is certainly less drought tolerant. So, um, my crystal ball says we're probably going to have less pinion pine and more juniper in the future and that likely that's probably what's happening is we are getting more infill from juniper than pine. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, next question, thanks for your presentation. Pinion J research shows that pinion J often nest in the woodland shrubland interface and cache and shrublands. Is this often where PJ removal takes place and usually without nest canopy surveys? Have you considered looking at the difference between types of treatments at this interface and how these might differentially impact J's? Example, hand thinning versus chaining, complete versus selective removal, feathering versus hard lines, et cetera. Yeah, good, good question. And so, you know, one thing I'll say is that that approach that we took uh, to modeling pinion J relative abundance um, even though it's at a fairly fine scale it takes in large landscapes in terms of our making actual prediction and so when we looked at were cuts at least targeted for sage grouse by, via the sage grouse initiative overlapping with pinion jay occurrence those um, really encapsulated a much broader landscape than what you see predictions at and so we didn't really see you know Via that line of inference, we didn't see a large match between where cuts are taking place again at that shrubland continuum with pinion jay occurrence. Now, that being said, um, I know that there is some work um, proposed, and I believe underway now by Scott Summershoe and all, that are looking at that more nuanced view of particular practices and particular cuts doing pre site surveys. Um, I don't know that there are uh, standardized protocols for surveys um, prior to management in areas. And um, so that's something that uh, Summershu and other folks are working on. Um, so I'd say stay tuned for that in terms of specific methods for removal and looking at um, impacts to pinion J occurrence locally. Great, thank you. 
Uh, next question, where did you get the information on PJ die-off? There is more going on than just drought. I'm curious to what I'm curious as to what information was used. Um, yeah, I can answer that, Jason. I think uh, I don't have that slide in front of me, but I believe it's just Peter Weisberg's work, um, some of the published work recently um, out of the Great Basin. And I think there's been um, Rick Miller's monograph. There, there was a webinar that the Fire Science Exchange hosted about a month ago. Uh, there's a 300 page monograph that goes into a lot of this. And then, of course, in the Southwest, there's been widespread documented um, die off. So um, there is literature out there. I think it's well known that it's happening. Um, the interesting thing to me is, at least in the Great Basin, when you compare that, um, those local observations of die-off with the overall footprint of pinyon juniper, we're still seeing increases in, in the woodland um, extent and density. So uh, maybe it is that shift to more juniper, we're not quite sure, but um, I think there's just a continuing amount of science being done to try to figure out why it's happening, what are the causes, and all of that. Thank you. Next question. Thank you so much. Are there recommendations for PJ thinning distances in pinyon jay habitat? Hey, I'd refer folks to that conservation strategy put together by Summer Shoe et al. I don't know that we have any um, really mechanistic science-based specific recommendations there. And I think what Jeremy was talking about with a holistic watershed approach to management is that we're missing that piece really for what management looks like for pinion jays um, and sagebrush obligates. And so I'm encouraged that we might have that science coming down the pipes in terms of what does stand management look like uh, with respect to pinion jay habitat needs. But until we really have both the local habitat requirements understanding for pinion jay and also match that up with the landscape tools in terms of where that takes place and what are the broader landscape requirements for the species, um, unfortunately, we're just not there yet. Yeah, you know, I'd like to add to that. We, we didn't have all the answers when we started managing for sage grouse either. Um, Jason showed you what Barack Mordeau taught us, and then we had some hypotheses. But we importantly had to combine that with science and monitoring and evaluation. And so we, we didn't just do that in a two years master's project at a small scale. We set up a long-term large scale experiment and we learned from that over a decade. So uh, I think the same type of investments are going to need to be made when it comes to pinion jay instead of just um, you know small localized studies of, of projects that can't really get at the causal mechanisms we're going to have to invest in the science and realize that their habitats are changing too you know i like to say succession happens and whether you like it or not something's going to happen and we probably need to take our best hypotheses combine that with the the outcome-based monitoring that needs to be done and learn as we go. Great, thank you. Next question, I am interested in habitat changes in portions of landscape with limber pine and mountain scrub interface mix. Are there similarities with what your research is finding in PJ types? Yeah, real quick, getting back to Jeremy's comments earlier is, um, Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of that information from these landscape tools on the exact stand dynamics of what the species composition are. Um, I can say that our tools encompass uh, a broad range of uh, species in terms of conifer, in terms of how it uh, impacted variation in relative abundance. But at that stand level, we, we don't have that necessarily nuanced picture and that's where local scale studies can, can fill that niche. Yeah, and there's, you know, um, Another theme here being conveyed that as we work, uh, you know, kind of outside of just the Great Basin Pinion Juniper, you get into the Colorado Plateau, and then you start looking at from a sage grouse standpoint, uh, you know, Montana, uh, Limber Pine, Ponderosa Pine, um, 
we've just started talking about conifer expansion as a, a bigger phenomenon than just even one uh, plant community type. In fact, if you wanted to, you know, extend this to the plains, eastern red cedar is perhaps the biggest offender of all in terms of invading grasslands and turning them into woodland. So this is happening um, at very large scales all over the country. It's having consequences for grassland and shrubland dependent species. Great, thanks. You said all over the country, but all over the world too, right? Worldwide, Global. yeah. yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on a strategy of leaving pinion pines in place during PJ removal projects to help with pinion jay decline? I guess then it would just be jay removal, huh? <laughs> Yeah, I, again, like Jason introduced his, we, we get into hypothesis mode. So we are talking about unknowns, which should be monitored when we do these things. But here, here's where I would start. Um, we need to use the ecological site information we have based on soils, um, landscape position, and what we know about these sites to inform a management strategy. So. Uh, I've often said, you know, this isn't an art project. We're not out there just picking and how we're going to, you know, arrange different trees and which trees. The site potential informs what we should be doing to reconstruct that historic stand structure. So thinning projects on, in pinion juniper woodlands, um, yes, perhaps some selective thinning of juniper and leaving pinion pine might be an appropriate type of uh, strategy given that we know pinion pines seem to be in trouble um, in places. Now, if you did that same thing on this shrubland uh, box down here on the right, um, you know, that's a recipe for creating predator perches for sage grouse all over the landscape. So, you know, it, it's context dependent and these recommendations really need to be specific to where you are on this continuum. Thank you. Um, Scott Summershoe says, we are wrapping up survey protocols to assess J occurrence before and after management, and we have guidance on doing nest surveys. I think there's a lot of opportunity to assess type of treatment and potential impacts to Js. We have a lot of questions about J declines. Um, I'd love to look at thinning enclosed canopy PJ and see if Js respond positively. We don't have extensive management recommendations for Jays yet. There's little research on Jays so far, but he's happy to talk to folks and you can contact him to discuss J management, et cetera. Um, he says his email is scott under, underscore summer shoe at uh, fish and wildlife service or fws.gov. But we can, um, Scott, we can send out your email in the follow-up follow -up email that, send, that gets sent out tomorrow. So thank you very much. I don't know if you guys want to comment on that at all or. No, I, I'd say thanks to Scott for chiming in there. I know he's working on this hard. He's been, had some projects lined up. So um, appreciate that, Scott. And just like we have this continuum along here, you know, it's it's just a matter of matching up or inference what we learned from science to where we occur on this continuum. And he's doing great work there. So appreciate him. Great. What proportion of the decline in sagebrush obligates could be addressed by restoring sagebrush step lost to conifer expansion? That's a great question. Um, I don't, we don't have a number for that, but that's something where we can get into the scenario world for sure. Um, I'd point people to a, a similar paper that's been done for sage grouse in the Gunnison Basin where Dr. Kevin Doherty did some simulations with known impacts of conifer on populations there. And then went to the scenario world they said well what if we do x y and z versus business as usual and found that yeah you can actually stem stem losses of um gunnison sage grouse in this area via conifer removal and i think just the work by ann rolson and others are proof of concept for that in the sage grouse world it'd be a little more back in the napkin honestly for bird populations but we certainly could look at that with some of the tools we have available now Great, thanks. Are there ways to selectively thin poor producing pinion versus healthy vigorous pinion, or will this have an effect on the change of genetics evolution for more drought tolerant trees? That's way beyond my area of expertise. Um, 
I think there are people that know these things and we should be talking to them uh, about what we do know, what we've tried in the past, what we've learned. Um, yeah, it's, it's not going to be uh, an easy thing, but I think the foresters and that, that mindset of thinning to enhance pinion vine production, has, people have been working on that type of thing for a while. I'm just not as familiar with the literature. Great. Forest stand dynamics is very complicated as it is for sagebrush ecosystems. What information is being utilized to study this die off? Science and forest management tells me we are asking the right questions about PJ expansion, climate change, carbon sequestration. Is this being studied and by whom and what agencies? You got anything to add there, Jason? I'd say that um, I yeah in the labs that you mentioned before, Jeremy, on w folks that are studying um, pinion pine die off. But you, most of my literacy in this world comes from the remote sensing team, where we look at large scale changes. Um, you know, really from a landscape or ecosystem perspective in terms of um, stand dynamics. So again, not looking at particular species. Um, composition, but just the overall footprint and change of conifer communities. And I'd say folks at uh, University of Montana through the Rangelands Analysis Platform are working on this. Uh, Jeremy Wrench and Eastern Red Cedar, there's a lot of folks at the University of Nebraska Lincoln who are piped into the ecosystem impacts of changes in red cedar and resulting biological impact. Um, and Jeremy, you might have some more on the uh, species-specific labs there. Yeah, you know, uh, um, Colorado State has uh, Steve Filippelli and his his crew over there have more work going on in remote sensing of biomass and carbon. That's, some, I guess, some NASA-funded work that continues. Um, I think of uh, I think of Peter Weisberg at UNR when I think about some of the in-depth climate stand structure work. So those would be folks I'd be reaching out to. Great, thanks. What do we know about how pin, how juniper and pinion differ in rate and distribution of infilling? Could species differences in infilling explain some variation in J occurrence? Seems like a ripe area for research. I read almost every word of Rick Miller's monograph and I, I don't recall hearing the answer to that one in there, but I would I would highly recommend everyone here download that um, that new publication. You can find it on the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange website. Rick Miller, um, Pinion Juniper Woodlands Ecology and Management. It's probably the state of our science for this region on on how things have have been unfolding and and some speculation on why. Yeah, and um, we can also send a link to that, uh, to Miller's synthesis um, in the follow-up email that, we'll, that you'll all receive tomorrow. Uh, generally, very little monitoring takes place with recent PJ removal. What suggestions do you have for developing a robust systematic post-PJ removal monitoring program? That's, that's a good question. and I. You know, my, my philosophy on that is let's not be sort of the little Dutch boy and go around and monitor every small project that we do and instead <laughs> invest in that large scale experimental work that Jeremy mentioned um, earlier. It's, it's long term, it's deliberate, and it's expensive, frankly, but it's really what you need to do to understand this. And so if it was up to me, I had the magic wand for what happens rather than focus on monitoring every pre-site and post-site management action that happens out there. I've worked with academia and agencies to come up with a long-term strategy to really get at the core questions and, and understand this from a mechanistic perspective. Yeah, and you know, I, I, I couldn't agree more with Jason here. We, we as a community in the sage grouse world, grappled a lot with this early on because sage grouse being a landscape critter uh, can't be studied at a project scale. They have to be studied at a landscape scale. And, and so, you know, we had, we had to go that route. Um, you can uh, study songbirds at a smaller scale. Um, I just wonder what it really means. 
Um, what, you know, what's the context of that information? Uh, so can we document that there's shifts from shrubland to woodland birds and vice versa when communities change stand structure? Of course we can, we already have. Um, but if we wanna get at some of the real causal mechanisms behind why we're seeing declines or actually maybe um, what does habitat restoration look like for woodland birds, uh, that's going to have to be a deliberate, um, well-designed experiment at a scale uh, where we can expect a population-level response. Great, thank you. Well, that looks like the last question. So I really um, appreciate everyone's participation and um, the great, good discussion. Um, I we would greatly appreciate it if you would take the three question survey that appears after I close out the webinar and we'll post a recording of the webinar on our YouTube channel this afternoon and then um, the link will be sent to you with the other information we discussed in the follow up email tomorrow. Um, yeah, and if you have any further questions regarding this or other webinars, feel free to contact myself and Jason left his um, email as well. Um, Thank you for that. So again, thank you all for attending. Thank you so much, Jeremy and Jason, for presenting today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, all. Yeah, have a good day, everyone.